2023. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Um, we are going to um, start the meeting with a, um, well first I'd like to give a notice that we had an executive session to discuss some legal matters right before this meeting and I will now ask anyone who'd like to come and speak on any issue uh, to public participation. Um, residents are permitted five minutes, any issue, whether it's on the agenda or not. You will also have opportunity to speak to um, any issue on the agenda that we will vote on during that time as well, but you're welcome up now. Good evening. Thank you for taking time. And I, I haven't done this in a long while, so <laughs> this is going to be fun to be back here. Um, there's an item on the agenda about the uh, police study and whether we want to hire more police, et cetera. And I'm here as a long-term resident to can support state, that. Sorry, can you state your name and address for the Yeah, record? it's Al Murphy, Glen Murray Road in Radnor Township, sorry. Um, I'm support of any increase uh, consideration for police in the township. Lot of, lots of reasons for that. Anyone that's been here for a number of years, we've been in the same house for four decades, uh, have seen changes in the township in terms of commercial and residential activity. Anyone who's driving on Lancaster Avenue, Montgomery Avenue, et cetera, knows all the risks that you take. And I think that risks are being taken in part because there's no accountability. You don't have to worry about getting caught. There's just not enough presence. Um, some other factors that we chat about within my cohort is Radnor and the contiguous counties to Philadelphia are only as safe as Philadelphia is safe. And if that issue starts to bleed out of the city and the city is getting riskier now, so there's potential for all of that. Um, coincidentally, uh, a week ago on the security system that we just installed, we caught a perp coming to our front door at 1.30 in the morning. I was able to talk to the police. I downloaded that interaction uh, from our system uh, to the police. Um, if I was away and my wife was there, it would have been a little bit more concerning, clearly. So the, uh, the reality is that uh, the reality does happen. And, and finally, security in any community uh, goes directly to quality of life and economic value. The reason our economy is great from a business and residential standpoint is for security. And uh, I think the more police we have, that'll increase that security and continue our economic growth. So thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? Good evening, I'm Tom Winters. I live on Williams Road in Rosemont. I'm speaking for my wife, Roberta, who regrets that she is unable to be here this evening. On her behalf, I wish to address item 4D, an introduction to ordinance 2023-03 on the business agenda that would allow for outdoor dining in Garrett Hill. This neighborhood was excluded from this use in 2013 for good reason. As the most densely populated ward in the township, we don't have the setbacks. While siting outdoor dining 50 feet from property lines and not the actual structure is an improvement over the last proposed ordinance, I can count the number of single family dwellings in this area on one hand. Why are those living in twins lacking safeguards? Residents of Wayne are protected by 100 foot setbacks not only for single family homes, but also from two family detached or semi detached dwellings, as well as unimproved lots. Just what is the setback for the twins and duplexes? One might wonder if the Garrett Hill neighborhood is a sacrifice zone to promote revenue for the rest of the township. Consider the Wayne Business District. It includes commercial areas that run for blocks along four-lane Lancaster Avenue, complete with parallel parking and numerous public parking lots. Restaurants abound from one end to the other. On the other hand, Garrett Hill is predominantly a residential area with small businesses interspersed among homes. Such mom-and-pop shops, along with the takeout venues for pizza, cheesesteaks, fresh fish, and a variety of ethnic foods, are housed in two or three small blocks along two-lane Conestoga Road. 
a third predominantly sit-down restaurant has recently joined the existing ones. Parking is limited and has become designated as privately owned or near, at, by nearly each establishment. Based on observation, one wonders if the existing and newly granted permits actually reflect reality. Currently, those wishing to patronize businesses vie for spots in our residential neighborhood. It is not uncommon to find cones and other space savers in the streets. Keeping the same number of spots by trading off seats inside a dining facility does not solve a parking challenge that already exists and that increasingly grows, with more, grows more problematic. Where will patrons park who wait for takeout or wish to dine when no tables or seats are available? Will there even be the required minimum 48 inches of sidewalk width kept free for pedestrians outside of dining areas? In all wards, outdoor dining will be permitted by special exception in many places, some with non-conformities and others in all PLO districts. Each commissioner should ask, what will this look like in your ward? What are your criteria for such exceptions? How will they be assessed? And what factors will be reviewed for their periodic renewal? Increased traffic as potential diners circle the blocks looking for parking is noteworthy. Some patterns have a snowball effect. Our streets are narrow. Those who drive on them often have to stop and make room for oncoming traffic. Cars pulling on and off Conestoga Road from a side street looking for parking create delays on this busy shortcut between Bryn Mawr and Wayne. This is also a popular route for emergency vehicles to Bryn Mawr Hospital. Given that this ward is the most densely populated area of the township, more traffic and related delays create hazards. Only so many mice can run through a maze before risks become difficult to tolerate. Noise is a well-documented factor in increasing stress. Whining and dining outside is intrinsically noisy. Competition with traffic and the stopping and starting of vehicles at the traffic light will make it even more so. Additionally, light pollution needs to be limited while regulations set parameters, who is going to constant, consistently enforce them? Just what is considered detrimental to the health, safety, and welfare of residents? Some believe we've already gone about as far as we should go. While the League of Women Voters does not have a stand on this important issue, this matter would be ideal for a local, state, and or national study. Through this process, different perspectives are reviewed and discussed until a consensus is reached. As a result, a position is reached from which we can advocate for political action. However, time is of the essence. It's up to you to stop, look, and act. The clock is ticking. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any other public comment at this time? I am not seeing any, so I will move to... Um, Recognizing the Finance Department for, for receiving the 11th consecutive Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting uh, from the Government Finance Officers Association for the 2021 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report and Audit. So I am going to ask Bill White and Bob Tate to come join me up front. So, um, <laughs> beautiful. Um, so I, I'd like to take this moment, and I appreciate the commissioners giving us time to recognize the finance department. Um, we're fortunate enough, uh, or fortunate uh, as an organization, to have uh, all of our departments excelling in their various areas. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we were uh, celebrating the work of our public information officer. We've acknowledged our police department, recreation department, public works. Uh, Comdev, uh, you name it. Um, finance, this is your turn. Um, it, it obviously someone that uh, did this for a few years prior to where I'm at now. Uh, I cannot understate the importance of having a finance team that takes it as seriously as our team does. 
uh, entrusting the public funds um, to the community is a, a heavy task, and they, they take it very seriously and do a fantastic job with the uh, absolute professionalism. Uh, as recognized by the Government Finance Officers Association of America, um, I think they term the uh, certificate, certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting as the highest uh, level of recognition for public finance. Uh, and as, uh, as President Maroney said, this is our 11th year. So, Mr. Tate, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank your team for uh, you being great once again. Uh, and probably a quick note to uh, acknowledge the other departments uh, and their, uh, their compliance with all of our rules and regulations, checks and balances. Uh, I know it's not always fun and easy, but um, it's absolutely essential. And everyone does a fantastic job. So thank you very much. Be much careful, that's slippery. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So thank you for that. Uh, congratulations. And moving on to our um, consent agenda. Is there any public comment on any item contained in consent agenda, which is item three on the agenda? I am not seeing any. Is there any item on the consent agenda that a commissioner would like to um, pull off for separate conversation? Seeing none, I will um, ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda. And a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you. Moving on to our business agenda. Um, resolution 2023-52, which is recognizing George Frederick Snyder, retired Radner. Sidner, pardon me. Um, my apologies. George Frednick, Frederick Sidner, a retired Radner police officer and resident of Williams Road and Garrett Hill Radner Township. Uh, by designating Williams Road honorarily the George Sidnor Way. And I am going to ask uh, Commissioner Farhi, would you like to speak to this? Yeah. Um, if, do we have uh, Reverend Howard and, and you just stand up because he was your father? Uh, and then we have uh, one of George's, your George's son as well. So both Radner, uh, Radner High School alumni and they have a lot of ties to the community. Um, first, the first thing, uh, first, what I want to do is thank Tammy Cohen. Tammy, you wrote this, so thank you very much for leading the charge on this. This is uh, very important, uh, not only to me, um, as well as to the community and to Garrett Hill. Um, many of you may know of George, or you may not, um, but George was the first uh, African-American um, policeman, detective here. He, uh, we have members of Villanova, he won, um, race, I believe, with Villanova, and he even held a world record. But um, that kind of pales in comparison to the type of person he was. And he always had a smile on his face. And um, you can go up the stairs, and you can see um, in some of the boxes there um, some of his personal effects from the police uh, when he was a member there uh, of the police. But what, there is one thing that I do want to say. and. Um, I could say a lot of things, but we have a long agenda and I will be brief. There is, um, it's a really special, it's just so special, it's Williams Road. So Williams, if you know Conestoga, half of Conestoga divides. One side is Williams, which will now be the George Sidner Way, and the other side is Emlyn Tunnell Way. And they both meet in the heart of Garrett Hill, which is Conestoga. So to me, there is nothing more special than that. and. Again, um, it's a way to keep his name and to keep his memory alive. And I said this at the Emlyn Tunnell um, tribute when we uh, put the banner on the gas station, or I'm um, not the gas station, the comfort station. And they say that you die three times in life. The first time is when you realize that you're mortal. Um, the second time, um, I don't even know the second time. But the third time and the most, <laughs> the most important, it's, it's late for me. Uh, the, is the last time someone says your name. So as long as we can 
memorialize his name and people will see it every day and when they speak it, it will keep his name uh, and his memory and his legacy alive for the township and for years to come. So I am honored to speak to this and God bless you, Reverend Howard and everything. And I have this as well right here. I took this at um, your father's funeral. This was something special. Uh, it has uh, a lot of his life, great pictures in here. And this is something that if we could give to, because he is a member of the Delaware County uh, Legends uh, Hall of Fame, if we could give him this uh, and they can put that in there so we will never forget uh, his amazing accomplishments to the community. So thank you. Reverend Howard, would you like to speak to this? Otherwise, I will call the vote. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> My brother Chris said, be brief. <laughs> I don't know if a preacher can ever be brief, but I'll be about 30 seconds. <clears throat> Hello. Hey, I'm Reverend Howard, um, the pastor of St. John AME Church in Rosemont, Garrett Hill, where we're from. Um, I'm honored. Um, dad was everything. He was the goat to us, seven children, uh, two of which he raised that were not his own, me being one of them. Um, it's, just, it's just an unbelievable thing. You know, seven children, 12 grandchildren, and one great-grand, all from the heart of Garrett Hill. Um, we'll be Garrett Hillians for life. We'll be Raiders for life, or Raptors for life. Um, but the reality is that's all I have to say. And our, bro you know, the, my brothers and sisters who could not be here with us, they're here with us in spirit. Um, they're grateful. They're thankful. And that, that dad's legacy will, will live on forever, not only just in Radnor Township, but right on, right in Garrett Hill, the heart of the hill. Thank you, Sean. Appreciate you and all the commissioners and all of you residents. Thank you. God bless. So I'm looking for a motion to approve. So moved. And a second. second. All in favor say aye. aye. Thank you. Okay, moving on to, um, oh good, this is a um, caucus preliminary land development approval for Villanova University Library. Evening. Nick Cagnelli representing the uh, Villanova University. Uh, as you can see, this is a proposal to construct a new library on campus. It's located in the middle of campus, kind of the closest neighbor is the railroad tracks, and across from the railroad tracks, of course, is Villanova Law School. Um, it's several hundred feet from any neighbor. Uh, the process was originally Villanova proceeded to the Zoning Hearing Board. They had a review by the Planning Commission who recommended approval by the Zoning Board. The Zoning Board did approve and granted three variances, one for height, one for building length, and as you can see the building length, you have architectural offsets that uh, offset that building length. And then the final one was for off-street parking since uh, this is serving the, uh, the current uh, student population on campus. Um, since that time, uh, Universities received shade tree approval for the project. They have gone back to the Planning Commission. Planning Commission recommended approval of the project with all the requested waivers. Uh, this evening, I believe this is really the first time that this presentation has been made by the board. We'll try to keep it as brief as possible since I think you're all familiar with it. Um, and uh, Kevin Smith from Ramza, the architect, will describe the project, give an overview. Mike Kissinger from Pannoni would also describe the uh, engineering aspects of the project. So, Kevin? Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Kevin Smith, uh, Robert Hamster Architects in New York. We're very pleased to be back in front of you um, and very excited by this uh, project. Um, 
it is a replacement for the current library, as you can see on the map. Fall View Library is not the, um, is actually two separate buildings that don't um, work particularly well, and we're proposing to relocate it um, again in the center of the campus, and um, it is even shielded from the nearest neighbor with a railroad track by a parking garage. Uh, it replaces a Kennedy Hall, which is now the home of the uh, Villanova Bookstore, not a much loved building. Um, and our intention is to, to put it very close to that footprint. It, it, is, it, it also fills a parking lot that is behind that building. Um, also not particularly uh, beautiful. And so instead of that view of that, this is the view from the ellipse that's outside the Connolly Center. And Core Hall is on your, on your left. Um, so that would be the main entrance for, for students. Um, it is, as you can see, three levels so to, uh, from, this, from this point. Um, it's narrow ends face, I guess technically this is the, the western edge, um, which faces the old library and there's a long vista um, of that and another entry at one of these towers um, that mark uh, also uh, the, the really campus facing uh, side of the, of the library. And at the other end, um, there is a circle outside the Connolly Center, and this will be a new kind of greeting greeting spot um, for for people who have come onto the campus this this way. Um, and so you can see the library from from there. And with that, I will pass it to Mike Kissinger. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mike Kissinger with Pannoni. Uh, a civil engineer for the project, working with Villanova. So if you look at the plan that Kevin had described on the screen there, you see Core Hall off to the, the bottom left, uh, the Connolly Center on the right, and the SAC parking garage. So if you were to come in um, from the pavilion side of the campus, that road would lead you up through the Connolly Circle and that garage. So just to orient yourselves there, what you see is, um, uh, again, a, the, the new library location but just to put in perspective of what was there versus today, uh, this plan only represents about a 5,000 square foot increase of impervious because of the area is, much, uh, is already very much impervious. So that parking lot and things like that are being con uh, you know, transitioned to building area. Um, those green spaces you see on the structure are actually uh, green roofs. And uh, so really it's, a, it's quite an improvement in terms of stormwater. So what we've done on this slide is highlighted all of our stormwater features that are being proposed. Um, again, those same green play, uh, buildings areas, that's about 15,000 square feet of green roof being proposed in that area. And off to the right-hand side, you'll see a, a teal color. Those are um, bioswales and an above-ground uh, stormwater feature. And, and lastly, across the north of the plan there, there's a dark blue subsurface system. So this uh, project, while increasing minimal increase of impervious, will have a, a great impact on uh, stormwater management in the area. And, and if I go back to, you can see how well landscaped as well. Um, it really looked nice as uh, pictures in, that Kevin showed. Um, so really in terms of the project, there are a few waivers that we'd be requesting. Uh, the first of which is for preliminary final plan approval. So um, we have had reviews from your consultants. I believe that uh, those letters are all, will comply. I think they're actually pretty clean, pretty short letters. And uh, we don't see any issues in them, except for just uh, describing these waivers to you. So uh, that would be preliminary final. The second one is actually the plan size. This is one we typically get. Um, just with the amount of engineering to show on the plan, it's very hard to make them at that small scale. So what we typically do is have them at a larger plan size and scale them for recording. Um, this one is a more of a dimensional one, which is uh, loading docks. So the code requires a 14 foot by 60 foot loading dock. 
Um, we don't have the need for a uh, loading dock that size. We really would be using uh, single unit vehicles. And so we are proposing two loading spaces. They are just smaller in size. So they're 12 foot by 30 feet. So we are asking for a waiver there. Um, and I would defer to your consultants. That comment there you see on the screen is actually from, from the review letters. And uh, also a typical one that we request is about survey um, within 500 feet. So in this project, you'll see our, our structure and our area is highlighted in the center there, and that reflects the 500 feet. We do have survey of that area. What we don't have is 500 feet from the property lines, north, south, and east, and west. And so what we typically do here is provide aerials and topographic information from GIS and so on. So we have done that. Um, but it is, still requires a waiver from the ordinance. And I think I flew through that, but that's, uh, in general, the engineering of the, of the project. Thank you. Do we have any um, questions from commissioners? How tall is it? Do you know off the top of your head? The spires seem... Yeah. 60 feet, four stories in one area, as was shown on the plan, three stories in the other. There's a change of slope. That was one of the reasons for the variance, actually. Mr. Norsini, do you have anything to add to this presentation? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. No, we have no objections with the requested, um, the requested, uh, we're drawing a blank, waivers. Thank you so much. Yes, we have no, no objection to them. Any other comments? Jake? Yeah, Nick, you said um, as part of the project, you're getting rid of the parking lot behind? Yes, that's correct. How, how many parking spaces is that? Do we know? Go ahead. I think, it was, a, I think it was about 12 spaces. Just about 12. Okay. Yeah. It's just a flat lot. It was, yeah. It, honestly, it was a more of a service lot. Yeah, it's the loading dock to the existing building and, and some service vehicles. What's the height difference going to be from the bookstore to the new library? Yeah, it's the bookstore is probably, I think it's 35 or less than 35? I think it's 40, the bookstore? The bookstore? Okay, so it would be 60 to 45, I believe. So um, the pictures of it, it looks like to it, it's a pretty imposing building. Is it going to be sort of a, a featured building on the campus with the double spires and the height of it? Is it, is it going to feel like a, like a featured building on the campus? Um, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No, it is meant to be. It is the university library, and so it is a, a building. You, know, you, you won't be able to see it from off outside the campus, but it, it, it wants to have a presence. And, yeah, actually, during zoning, we actually did shots from the neighboring areas, and you couldn't see it from off campus, but certainly it's pretty imposing when you're on campus. And I don't mean imposing in a bad way. It just seems like it oh. really is a feature building. Yeah, and that's what they did, too, with all the architectural offsets. Even though we had to ask for building length, uh, with the, all the offsets, it really doesn't feel as if it, it's that long a building. Yeah, and, and I would say there are... It is not the tallest building on campus. Not. But, you know, Tollentine, which is visible, is, is, is significantly taller. It's about 80 feet tall. Obviously, the church is much, much, much uh, more imposing. Uh, so, sorry, did you have a side view of it? Just sure. I think it's. Look at it. So you can see What's the. Height. That's one of the sides. That's from Connolly. Yeah. And I think you can see here also that there's a full story of grade change from what's on the left down, which is really what exists now with, with Kennedy. Mm -hmm. So it's a story higher on the south side than it is on the north. And then that, in a way, behind those trees is the three-story uh, SAC garage. Yeah. And then further down, the, the old library is and, further down on the right. Uh, the old library is straight 
back behind the building. Yeah. So that's the other end, and the old library would be behind your back when you're looking. Yeah. Is that core on the right? That's core on the right. Uh -huh. And you can see the garage off to the, off to the left okay. behind the trees. I would just like to say that I think the building looks beautiful. Definitely enhanced uh, the campus. Um, so no problems there. I know that there's a neighbor's meeting set tomorrow. Tomorrow. So uh, hopefully you'll talk about it. And I'm going to do my best to be there. But if give you a little plug there, Chris, if you want to talk about the neighbor's meeting and uh, Th something to look forward to. Thank you. Yeah, we do have a neighbor's meeting tomorrow, our general neighbor's meeting. Um, this was the subject of a dedicated neighbors meeting at the end of March where we did bring it up and we also talked about it in October. So um, we have brought it up in public and we'll certainly add it to our list for tomorrow to make sure as well. What, what time is it? 7.30? You said at the 7 at the... 7 o'clock at the Mullen Center, right at the corner of Lancaster and Ivan. Any other questions or comments from commissioners? Looks really nice. No, I think it looks... I think it looks beautiful. Really nice job. Excellent. Okay, since it's caucus, there's no vote, but we appreciate you being here and continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will move on to the presentation from the Environmental Advisory Council on the survey results. Good evening, everyone. Danelle Jagman, I'm in Petrie Avenue, and I am on the Environmental Advisory Council. I've been on for a few years now. Um, earlier this year, we did, with your permission, a survey of the residents of Radnor Township by email um, and electronic format. Um, and we reviewed those questions with you ahead of time and promised that we would return with the results. So I'm here to go over those with you today. Uh, again, the survey was composed on Google Forms and results can be shared if you would like in a more detailed format um, or with any other interested parties. It was advertised on the township website um, through social media and uh, your email newsletters. It was opened on December 5th and we received our last response on March 4th. Uh, we had a 151 total responses. I will note that some of these response counts may not equal 151 because not all of the questions were required. As far as respondents go, we did ask how long they had lived in the township. Uh, the majority, 75% have lived in Radnor Township for an impressive more than nine years. Um, but maybe this speaks to how the township's communication reaches residents who have resided in for less time. Uh, and then 97% of those uh, respondents also owned their homes or living spaces. And we did get that response from everyone, even though it was optional. We asked about the utilization, their current utilization of Radnor's weekly recycling and yard waste pickup because this is um, a featured uh, benefit of the t uh, community. Uh, most folks, 85% said that they use both of those weekly pickup services. Uh, and I'm sure you can tell by the volume that we pick up every week. Um, and just 13% said they use recycling only. We also asked if the township's residents were aware of the ordinance that prohibits the use of plastic grocery bags. Um, that was effective uh, earlier this year in March, and 84% of the survey respondents at the time were aware of that. Um, but you will recall that most of these responses were actually uh, submitted prior to the effective date of the ordinance. And just personally, I know that a lot of um, the shops waited until the last moment to put up those signs. So I think that um, at this point, nobody can ignore it, but um, prior to it being effective, we had about 85% of understanding of that. We also asked about the recent Burgtown recognition um, in Radnor Township, uh, and 65, 64% were aware of this. 
as far as environmental issues concerning the residents, we asked them to indicate their top three concerns. They did not have to indicate three concerns and they could also write in an other concern. 80% or 80 respondents selected as one of their top three waste runoff in streams and other water quality issues. And then down this list um, were the top issues selected, household waste refuse, um, use of herbicides and pesticides on public and private property, air pollution from idling vehicles, maintaining natural environments, burning of fossil fuels, and green construction practices were among the top. Um, 19 write-in responses were provided, and some of those were not environmental issues, but for transparency, I have listed them here. Um, solar parking lots, um, light pollution, police motorcycles, um, high-powered uh, lawn equipment, leaf blowers, et cetera. We also asked about their current um, level of participation in select sustainable practices. So to orient you to this slide, the blue number is respondents who indicated that they already do this activity. The red number is that they try, but it's really difficult. And then the orange, yellow is that they're interested in doing it. Um, if they didn't respond, they didn't have to respond to one of these. They could leave it off if they were not interested. Um, we had a lot of folks that are interested in composting at home or composting pickup, uh, reducing food waste, which is similar to that, uh, healthy lawns, energy-saving home features. We have a lot of folks that already do that, um, some that are, find it difficult still. Um, owning electric vehicles had a lot of interested respondents, 62 individuals. Um, and so on. You'll note that using solar energy, only eight people do it and 67 were interested. Uh, this is just the um, folks that wanted follow-up. Um, we had 47 residents provide their email address to get a follow-up um, from the Environmental Advisory Council. We have not done that yet, but um, it's in, our, in process for us. We'll discuss at our meeting later this week. In conclusion, uh, we recognize that there is good interest in composting, and this is something that the council has actually discussed in our meetings prior. There are several composting um, services that are locally owned and other townships that have been piloting composting programs on a municipal level. We also would like to highlight the Radnor Township residents that have already uh, invested in solar panels on their home. We do have one example of that so far. Uh, because 67 residents or respondents in, uh, express interest in solar energy. Uh, we also want to combine that with sharing more about Solarize Delco, which offers affordability grants to qualified homeowners in Delaware County, uh, and just make more awareness of those programs available to our residents. We also had uh, quite a few interested in owning electric vehicles, so we'd like to explore educational options or grant options and resources with residents as well. And we also um, launched our eco-friendly yard program through the township on April 20th. So far, um, between six and 12 residents have actually received their yard signs, which are quite beautiful. We have been taking them out to their properties personally, the members of the council, um, and we get a couple emails every week about people who would like to have those signs. Any questions? I'm really uh, grateful that you came back with the results. I think you've got, I know it was a low number of people um, compared to the number of residents, but um, I think you got some really good information. Um, and are there any questions or comments from I, other I commissioners? I have one comment. Uh, you're sure. fairly new to this board, is that correct? Um, I have been on the Sorry. council for Two and a half or three years. Okay. Yes. Um, all right. Uh, way to step up. This was. Wonderful. Oh, thank you. Um, I don't know. Maybe I've just seen so many people, and I remember <laughs> you from all the um, all the interviews that we do. But no, this is wonderful. You stepped up. Um, I don't typically do these things, but I did it. It was easy. It was straightforward. Thank you and for participating. A lot, of, a lot of good information. So thank you. I appreciate sure. that. I have a question. Sure. Are you hearing any um, negative feedback about the plastic bag ordinance? I have not personally from um, shoppers, but um, I am a regular at the Lancaster County Farmers Market and the manager has approached me 
um, once or twice about it as it's gone on. Um, and I think it's just the vendors um, adjusting to it, but everybody seems to be on board there. Um, I think he like really tracked me down the first weekend afterwards. He's like waiting for me to walk in, I think. Um, and we just talked about the options for folks and um, reiterated that they could use their remaining stock and that of course there was exceptions for raw meat, et cetera. Um, and it seems to be going smoothly. I've not heard anything else. I just signed up with Mother Compost, so oh, yes. I'm going to be one of the ones that can then check that <laughs> box that I actually did. They already come down our street for me. I know, they do. You told me before. So, so um, excellent. I love the, I want to encourage everyone to use a company like Mother Compost. I'm also a subscriber, and I've been doing it for probably three years since they started their business. It's great, and it's, once again, a habit that you have to get into, just like bringing your plastic bags to the market. Um, but once you get into the rhythm of it, it's just wonderful. And you really, um, you, you get a sense of how much your waste you're saving. They give you statistics. So mm -hmm. it's really, it's a, it's a really great program. Yeah, I think we'll uh, reach out to them again about um, the residents' interest in their program and others. Um, they're not the only provider, uh, but uh, sometimes it's just about educating the residents about which services are available and how affordable it can actually be. Oh, uh, yeah, just to comment on the uh, environmental issues concerning residents, mm -hmm. like the top uh, four or five, and I think they're good. Yeah, that that one. The uh, and I know the township's trying to do stuff with uh, uh, stormwater and uh, further down, herbicides, pesticides on public and private property, you know, that should be of concern. Um, I'm not sure if the township could do something. I know the township and even the school, when they're uh, taking care of the fields, they're using stuff that isn't dangerous to, you know, kids that are on the field. Mm -hmm. um, and then air pollution, idling vehicles, and then lawn equipment. And we had a speaker from your mm -hmm. committee, and she said, and it's really the two cycle weed whackers and mm -hmm. blowers, like nobody should use those anymore. Yeah. They should go to battery or something. And the four cycle is not as bad. It has maybe a muffler, but not anything else that really take pollution out. But it would be nice to kind of promote like those battery powered ones or way better for the environment. Yeah, and I think that I'll say that I think that um, most homeowners have changed to the battery powered, but it's the lawn care companies that are very popularly used in the township that still operate the heavier ones. Yeah, and even the, the lawn companies that put in herbicides or pesticides, I remember watching one and it was on a rainy day and they're spraying their stuff. I'm like, you're not supposed to do it on a rainy day. Really, you shouldn't do it at all. But they didn't seem to care. They were getting paid mm -hmm. either way. Um, yeah, I wish they would use it less. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Thank you. You're welcome. Great presentation. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay. Um, our next item on the agenda is Ordinance 2023-03. This is the introduction. It's an ordinance of Radnor Township, Delaware County, Pennsylvania, to permit limited outdoor dining facilities in the Garrett Hill Conestoga Road, GH-CR District. I am going to um, ask Commissioner Farhi to lead us in on this. Thank you. Um, I first want to thank uh, John Rice, uh, Steve Norsini, um, well as Patty and you, Commissioner Moroni, for uh, allowing uh, this to be introduced again. Um, it's the same story. I think we've kind of retweaked this. We've separated outdoor dining um, with the height restrictions from the overlay. Um, I believe that it is something that the neighbors want. Uh, I know that a bunch of you, including myself, um, got emails today stating that they don't want it, but um, I can show you many emails that I have prior as well as polls that uh, the majority wanted. It was uh, 41 or 42 to 3 um, that it's for. And I think it helps the community, um, our businesses, whether they're in Garrett Hill, whether they're in Wayne, 
uh, need to be able to compete with um, a ton of uh, external factors, whether it's Uber Eats, whether it's Lower Marion, whether it's uh, Devon, Devon Yard or King of Prussia. So uh, at Garrett Hill, we're not asking for anything more. We just want a level playing field. And I think outdoor dining, limited outdoor dining uh, is good. And it would help all the businesses there if they decide that they want to use it. And if they don't want to use it, they don't have to. So quite simple. Uh, I don't know, Steve, I know that you did that. Uh, you helped create the ordinance as well as uh, Mr. Grimm. So uh, if you guys want to chime in, please feel free to, or not. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. So uh, just some of the highlights uh, of the ordinance that uh, Mr. Rice uh, worked on. So it notes that outdoor dining shall be permitted as an accessory use on the same premise as a licensed food establishment. Uh, there are setbacks, 50-foot setback shall be required in the GHCR district between outdoor dining and the property line of any adjacent single-family dwelling. Um, and I think probably the, the most important part of the ordinance was that it was parking neutral. So the way it's worded is uh, it's a one-for-one -one reduction of indoor seating for outdoor seating. So if a restaurant owner wishes to have 10 seats outside, they have to reduce the interior seating by 10 seats. Uh, that was to try to address uh, the fact that you would need no additional parking, or relatively no additional parking. Uh, still permitted within the PLO as an accessory use, and uh, existing nonconformities, outdoor dining shall be permitted by special exception in all other zoning districts as an accessory use on the same premise as an existing licensed nonconforming food establishment. So that, that was the majority. It was really, it's a one for one. Uh, indoor seat for an outdoor seat. And uh, the other rules apply, right? This was just for Garrett Hill. So you still have to have the five foot free clear sidewalk, all those good things. But this was geared towards the Garrett Hill portion. Yeah. And when it comes to setbacks, um, the neighbors that have concerns don't live anywhere near the restaurants. Um, so uh, and the neighbors that live near the restaurants have that live within three, 400 feet. I have never heard anything from them. They, they seem to be for it. These are neighbor, neighborhood establishments, uh, more often than not, but not all the time. Um, people, uh, people walk there, people in the neighborhood walk there, such as myself. So again, um, just having everything on a, uh, on a equal playing field for all the businesses in Garrett Hill and Radnor and beyond, I think is the fair and equitable thing to do. So. And so just before we get, yeah, please. Go Just ahead. one clarification or to add, the, you know, as you know, Mr. Norsini mentioned, all of the requirements of applicable to other outdoor dining are applicable here. The only change we have here is the setbacks. Um, there are reduced setbacks here because everything's closer in Garrett Hill. But other than that, all the other requirements uh, still apply. Can you give us a such as? What are the other requirements? Uh, such as uh, sidewalk, uh, sidewalk width, uh, storage of uh, you know uh, tables and chairs in the off season, heaters, um, planters, uh, separating the outdoor dining area from you know other areas on the property and other public areas. So all all those things uh, still apply. Um, before we get into questions, I'm just going to ask for a motion to approve and a second. Second. Okay. Um, I do have some questions, but I'll open it up to uh, other commissioners first. Anyone? Jack, can you speak to the mic? What restaurants would qualify for this? Uh, so our acting zoning officer, Patty Kaufman, did some research into this. Um, I believe Conestoga style pizza because they have a wide enough sidewalk in front of them. Um, the Garrett Hill Ale House has a very small area in the, if you're facing it from Garrett on the left, but they don't have the sidewalk with. And Flip and Bailey's could do it in the area they were doing it during COVID. Um, I believe that's about it. So that was two? Three. I thought you said the other one didn't have the sidewalk with. Uh, Conestoga could, Conestoga style pizza could. Right. 
garage hill at ale house can but it wouldn't be street side it would be like in the parking lot still fifty feet away and flipping bailey's could do it <coughs> let me i'll just add on to that so there are two more so if all seasons became a restaurant and before it was a convenience store for a very short period of time um, they would be allowed to have um, uh, tables in their in their uh, uh, parking lot and then I know that uh, during COVID when there was outdoor dining I know that Antonella's briefly had um, uh, briefly had uh, tables outside um, so Garrett Hill Pizza could if they wanted to they're very limited on parking they could uh, get the uh, 50, what is it, 31? Is that exit 13? 13 or something? Yeah, I don't know that they would qualify, Commissioner. I okay. don't know that they have the sidewalk with. And I'm well, it's private property, answer. right? Is it is it sidewalk with or, or is it based based on private property? So if you have a sidewalk that that goes past your establishment, okay. you have to have that five-foot clear area okay. aside from the table so okay. people can walk. And then, and then, as you said, Conestoga Pizza, they, they've had tables out before during COVID as well. Right. Okay. Sorry to. I just have a quick one. This does not apply to rooftop dining. I mean, I know we're not really have any establishments that could do that, but. No, ma'am, they're not in Garrett Hill. Got it. Others before I go? I just have a, a list um, of a few questions. So, um, one is about the setbacks. I appreciate that um, the setbacks would be much smaller than required in Wayne. I think it's a very different um, space, so that makes complete sense to me. Um, my only question is about um, why is the setback only from a single family home and not a duplex or multifamily home? And maybe because there aren't any near these, but I think there are. Do we have an answer to that? Well, you can have attached single family dwellings and detached single family dwellings. And I think this applies to both. Unless Steve wants to say something differently. <clears throat> no, sir. So if it's, um, if it's a duplex, one, one structure, two homes with a wall in between entrance on the same porch, that's kind of the types of houses that I'm thinking of. Is that considered a single family home and it would be, um, 50 feet from that property? Yes. I do, uh, that's the way I, I've read it. Um, unless there's something unique in our zoning ordinance that would say no, but normally that's the way. A single family home, <coughs> what you're thinking of is a detached single family home, but there, you know, in zoning you also talk about attached single family homes, which are duplexes. Um, even townhomes can be considered that. <clears throat> okay, so this is inclusive of all residents that are in Garrett Hill. Yeah. There's no treatment that's different. Based that's the way we, that's the way staff looked at it, the okay. way Mr. Nelson described it. Excellent. Good. Um, uh, somebody wrote in in opposition to this and said it would be um, impossible to enforce the one seat for one seat. Can you talk to me about how we enforce our codes? So community development, um, when a restaurant opens or they go in for inspection, which, uh, which now the county does those inspections, but we have the ability to inspect for number of seats. Um, if they were to apply for outdoor dining and um, part of that process would be for us to go in, see the removal of X seats <clears throat> and the addition of X seats. Realistically, I know what the resident's saying. What happens after that? Yeah, you know, we, we look at everybody, we are hoping they are honest and continue in that fashion. I mean, and if somebody were to make a report to you that they think that the number of seats are um, additional and not uh, one for one, what would you do? Uh, a representative of community development would go count the seats and address that with whatever restaurant if they were uh, over and above what they're supposed to have. And if I can chime in on this, we have this problem with indoor restaurants. We had this issue years ago with White Dog, and we were chasing after them for years because they would throw additional seats in beyond their stated capacity under the fire code. So this is not just some Garrett Hill thing or some outdoor dining thing. It's, it's a problem we deal with all the time with all restaurants, um, and as Mr. Nassini stated, this is how we deal with it. <clears throat> to, to Mr. Nelson's point, we actually have a uh, 
fire code official now on staff, right? So that's Mike Mesco. So this is something uh, he can look at when he goes to these various properties. Um, so I think is there um, either in our general ordinance or in these amendments, is there anything that talks to the hours of operation that you're allowed to be outside versus inside? Um, it, or does it just track with um, our, you know, general hours of operation for restaurants? There's certainly nothing in this particular ordinance. I um, mean, I don't think there's anything in the general outdoor dining rules, but I'm not, I'd have to look, I'm not positive to that effect. Um, there would certainly be noise ordinance issues that they'd have to comply with, just like any other business. Okay, so I know that's one of the concerns of some of the residents is that it will create more noise in the neighborhood. So I know uh, we have a noise ordinance. I'm not remembering off the top of my head what time, 10 o'clock. So that would, um, I'm, I'm supposing that would mean that outdoor dining would have to wrap up and come indoors by 10, or is it just based on sound levels? I, I'd have to look at that ordinance language, but generally it's a, it's a noise ordinance, therefore it's based on sound levels. If, as long as your, your activity is quiet enough that you don't you know, go above de that limit of decibels, you should be fine. If, if you're done your questions, Margaret. I mean, I, I'm happy to, to put something in there where the last seating would be, say, at eight, and whether you're done or not, at nine o'clock, they can take your, tray, your plates in and and find a, you know, find a seat for you inside. Uh, I don't think noise is an issue. Um, I mean, we have a Superintendent Flanagan here. I don't want to put him on the spot, but I don't, I mean, I live there and I've never gotten huge noise complaints from these bars, even when there was a lot of uh, college kids drinking there. Like, it was news to me when um, there was uh, an event that happened at, at Flips years ago. So the neighbors weren't even, complaining about the noise. It was actually the business owner that called it in. Um, and then there is one graphic when you're done, if I could just put up on the screen for everybody. So I don't want to take your thunder, but Ian, when you get a chance, sorry. No, no, it's fine. I'm just kind of working through some um, issues that have been brought forth or just I'm sure. considering. So, so um, I'm in Ward 5, and I do have a handful of restaurants. Um, this ordinance would not apply to anything outside of the Garrett Hill area, correct? So we would have outdoor dining in Wayne, outdoor dining in Garrett Hill, but any restaurant in other parts of the township would not qualify. Am I reading that correctly? It's still well, allowed in the PL, sorry, yeah, the, still allowed in the PLO district. Yeah. There was the rooftop dining in the new hotel too. That had an hour restriction. Um, and then my final question is, um, is, is there any way to put an aesthetics type of requirement on this? Um, you know, there, there are ways to do outdoor dining that are visually appealing, and there are ways that look like, you know, you, you grabbed your lawn furniture out of your backyard and, um, you know, threw it up front. So is there a way to craft something in here that has some sort of aesthetic requirement for the types of furniture setup, you know, barriers, that sort of thing. Can I just touch on that? So um, I agree totally. Um, and I think that this is helpful because during COVID, it was kind of a hodgepodge. What do you have? Uh, and it's, you know, Target's a great store. We love them. But some of the uh, plastic lawn chairs are not aesthetic to uh, a nice neighborhood eatery. So I think that would actually work itself out. I think some of the business owners do want to do this and will invest. They don't want to have to invest twice with the cheap stuff and then do we know if we're going to get outdoor dining and then we bought, you know, high end, um, you know, metal cast iron tables that now we can't use. So I think that they, you know, there's a lot of pride in Garrett Hill and I think a lot of these restaurants, they're staples, they're anchors, they want to, uh, they want to be here for a long time and and uh, so I don't, I don't think that's an issue but if that becomes an issue absolutely let's no one wants um, 
No yeah, one wants so to I'm feel just, trashy. Yeah. So how do we how do we kind we, of we we already have regulations to that effect. Say again. We already have regulations on the books. So the, the current outdoor regulations limit the type of furniture that they can use, specifically to cast iron, wrought cast iron, steel, mm -hmm. wire steel, cast aluminum, extruded aluminum, frame wood, and wicker wood. Uh, and, maybe, and maybe even some recycled, uh, recycled plastic, I think, would be environmentally friendly. Yeah, that and actually, so, uh, that's something that would that I think is important. Plas plastic furniture actually specifically prohibited. Okay, well, maybe if it's recycled, then you know we can really help the environment on that standpoint. But I do want to draw everyone's attention to a poll that I put some time ago, and the neighbors are the neighbors generally speaking are for it. Um, it was 41 and. That is a, uh, a, a, a Facebook page that is um, mainly focused at people that live in Garrett Hill and Conestoga Village, or are people that live outside of it. But generally speaking, uh, there was not one comment uh, saying that they were against it, and um, people are in favor for it. People want it, and what I'm not asking, we're not asking for anything more. We just want a level playing field. And I think uh, if you look at that, um, that's what the people want. So forget the height. Um, that's a separate issue, but the outdoor dining they want as well. And I, I will just say to, I mean, thank you for showing this. I have asked you, like, you know, I think what, what I'm struggling with is that when issues like this come in front of us, the people who are most opposed to it um, speak the loud, loudest or first. And since this agenda came out and this item was on it, I only received just two emails, but they were both opposed. And so I asked Commissioner Farhi, um, how do we find the people who are in favor? So I appreciate this, but I'm gonna slice it a little bit by saying the question is um, conflating two issues, so I don't know who was in favor of what. I would say it's not you know, as scientific. I am, I'm prepared to vote yes on introduction, but what I would really ask you to do, we go down to one meeting um, per month in the summer. I would um, ask you to you help mean? us hear from residents who are in support of this. Because since it began, um, like I said, I understand that those who feel strongly against the issue are more likely to speak up and come forward. But if there is any way for you to convince us beyond your Facebook poll that there are people who would really like this, I am for outdoor dining. I um, am happy to um, vote yes in introduction. And I just ask you to, if you could get p emails. I don't need people I, at meetings. But I, I need to hear from I, somebody I other I've than had, you. I've had petitions. I've had emails. I've had neighbor meetings where I've had, went in front of planning. This was voted unanimously by our planning that it was fine for both. They didn't want it. They didn't separate it. And they could have. Delco voted unanimously for this and didn't want to separate. John Bryce, when he drafted the initial ordinance, said, I don't think it's that much of a one-off. So if you're looking for a reason not to vote for it, Absolutely, you can find something. But, I mean, we did neighbor meetings, we did snail mail. I mean, the amount of money and paper that this township spent contacting neighbors, Molly did something on Facebook and, and um, all this stuff. I put stuff out. I mean, it goes on and on and on. There were 15 different things. I remember rattling them off at a meeting and then it's just finding fault. Again, it is, an issue not about saying that we want something more. I mean, it's just a fight to become equal. And to me, that is, I mean, I appreciate you listening, but to me, that is beyond, it's, a, it's, it's upsetting. I mean, these are, you know. Sure, you know, I'm not trying to upset, I'm yeah, telling no, no, you, no, I've I'm only saying, heard the negative, yeah. I need to hear the positive. So you're, ta you're talking it. about the positive? I yeah, would love yeah, for no, no. somebody in your neighborhood to write to commissioners, come forward and speak to it. And it'll be reintroduced for final vote next month. That's all I'm I will, asking. I, I will get you plenty That's of all I'm people. Asking. I, I will put another poll up if you like. Madam so. President, just on one of your earlier questions, we also already still have regulations that limit outdoor dining between March 1st and November 30th. Hours of operation from 10 a.m. or sorry, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. And uh, all seating of patrons sh uh, shall provide for the dining area to close at 10 p.m. So that's when they have to go in. <clears throat> and Commissioner, I'm sorry, I did forget to add, as far as regarding Flip and Bailey's, when we analyzed that, 
they would need to go to the zoning hearing board for relief on uh, their existing parking nonconformity to do this. They have the room, but they would still have to go to the zoning hearing board. So I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, are there any other comments from commissioners? So, yes. I did pull a couple people that I know in the community and one person who is a, who's lived there for a very, very long time, has a family, she's a realtor, has her finger on the pulse, she is for it. it was not for the conflation of the 35 foot and Garrett Hill or, you know, um, putting parking in to, you know, that other. But she, she did say that it's something that people would value. So just wanted to share that with you. What's, what's the current state of outdoor dining right now? So we extended it. Has that expired? Until December. It'll sunset at the beginning, at the end of the year. Uh, yeah. Jake, it sunsets. And, and, and I, I've supported this in the past, and I, I have no issues with it. My, my issue now is that we've created this comprehensive planning group, which my understanding is it's their... We, we've kind of given the responsibility to them, to this group, to go out, hold these meetings and talk to the neighbors and, 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 and get the sense and then come back to us with recommendations. So what, what's the need to have a, a comprehensive planning group if we're gonna do the work for them and then, and then, set, and then set all these uh, new rules up and well, say, we've passed these, you know, you can change them if you want to, but we've already sure. done the work I, for you. I, I, I can speak to that if, if I could, Commissioner Maroney, just briefly. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll be delicate. Um, so, yeah, so um, there's just not a guarantee that this could get done. We don't know when we're gonna have the final version of the plan. And if that drifts into January, and then maybe a nice day in February or March, as you know, it's nice, then these restaurants kinda can't compete. So it's already May, the summer rolls around. All I'm saying is that yeah, unfortunately, you may have to t take the, the bite out of the apple that you didn't want to, um, but I think that it is important that, I mean, it's important to me, it's important to the community, and again, it's about equality and equitability, and I think the sooner that it gets done, the better, um, and it's something that, like I said, I just want it to be fair and equitable for, for all. And I don't know when, um, you know, uh, when we can get to the, uh, the final draft and then it's gotta get voted on and then it's gotta go to Delaware County and we are a little bit behind on the comprehensive plan. So there's no guarantee that we would have something in place by the first of the year when outdoor dining sunsets in Garrett Hill. Yeah, but they wouldn't be able to do outdoor dining the first of the year anyway. I, well, you, you know, you, you can get you a say couple- March would be the earliest? Yeah, but March you- March 1st. Yeah, you get a couple of nice days and you know, who knows? You, it doesn't matter if it's a nice day or not, it's March 1st. Oh, it's March 1st, period? Ah. Under our current ordinance, yes. Okay. So. Yeah, I, I, again, I mean, I'm, I'm one voice up here. I appreciate you supporting it the first time. Yeah, right? I voted, a, I mean, I voted it before we did the comprehensive planning group, but now I've supported and, and helped get people onto this board, this sub, subcommittee, to do the work and give us feedback. Um, I, I feel like we're circumventing the group that we've established and created. The, the overlay is a very complicated animal. So to spend a lot of the resources of a planning group, of a comprehensive plan group, whether it's a steering committee or the actual consultants to focus on a very, very small thing, which uh, our lawyers and this board can handle, I think may kind of, um, May, 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 may supersede it. I mean, we can handle it. We can handle it in a one-page ordinance, and then we can move on. So, so are we telling the group to do the whole community except Garrett Hill? No, no, Jay. I think you understand what I think. You, I, I mean, I think you understand what. Yeah, I'm but I mean, th there's some really smart people on there that I, I, I all, right, all right, full confidence I, that they can I, do I, Garrett all Hill. All right. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, okay. Yes. Are you done? I'm done. Okay. Um, now that commissioners have spoken, I would like to ask for public comment. Anybody care to speak to this? Hi. Uh, first of all, my name is Dee Delaney. I live at 229 Williams Road, maybe 100 feet from Flippin' Bailey's. And I, I haven't heard anything about the survey that uh, Commissioner 
far he has done, and I know he lives pretty far down on Rockingham Road, and I, I wouldn't expect him to hear any noise from the bars, but um, the people that where I live, we do. And um, the, the, my neighbors have been and are people that work in the healthcare environment. They're NICU nurses, they're OR nurses, they're professors at Villanova, um, also uh, community colleges, and they have families, they have kids, and any noise that happens right there, there there's, no, there's no barrier sup, to protect us from any noise. The parking lot butts up to the first twin. And this, is, you know, originally this was like mom and pop stores along Conestoga, this small strip. And uh, it's a very dense residential neighborhood, and everyone loves it there. And they love it there because of the community that we have. And I've had people that have lived on Boxwood, which is this home of mansions and things, tell me how lucky I am because we have a real community. It's something that you can't manufacture. It's like grown up from the ground up from the time the houses were built by immigrants and um, the African American community. And, and these were where the workers lived that built the mansions. Um, so I've lived in Renner Township for 29 years. The last 26 of those years, I've lived on Williams Road in my house. And um, we've just had a, a young couple move next to us, and he's an OR nurse, works for Mainline Health, moved in from Philadelphia, and his, and his wife is a healthcare professional too. And we were at their wedding Friday night. And everywhere, everywhere we went, we said, oh, we're their next door neighbors. I said, oh my God, they talk about that neighborhood all the time. They talk about you all that time. And they can't believe how quiet it is. So, um, Noise is a big consideration. Parking is a big consideration. And when people work and they're taking care of their families and they come home, all they want to do is find a place to park somewhere close to their house, not like three or four blocks away, uh, and be able to sleep at night, and be able to open their windows at night. Just that, like to get some fresh air. You don't have to have air conditioning or anything and not be woken up in the middle of the night from people leaving the bars where they've maybe inside or outside, but they've been drinking, talking loud, and then they walk down the streets to find some sort of parking where they park their car, and, they, and, and it's a very loud discussion that they carry when they are leaving the bars. So, um, and I love your idea of waiting until the uh, planning commission the, for the comprehensive plan for Renner Township where there's an opportunity to talk to people and uh, in the communities to get their feedback. And um, I think that's a great idea because it will be, I think it'll be a, a better plan. And as far as like the semi-detached housing or not, in, in the wording, it, it doesn't say semi-detached houses. And I think everything has to be nailed down so that it's, crystal clear, there are no semi, I mean, single family homes, single family homes, single homes on Williams Road until you get past uh, uh, like the first two blocks. And then there's single family homes. And that, from down there, you don't hear anything, but from where we are, we do. And um, I, I didn't know anything about this until today. I, I've had health, health issues. And other people have had babies that they're taking care of and little kids, and I don't think they've had a chance. I don't know, you know, if you've sent out flyers or went door to door on Williams Road, but I'd be happy to do that. I'd be happy to take on that responsibility to survey people and get it from both sides on Williams Road and other, other roads. And, um, but I do really appreciate your concern and your listening. And just imagine you're living there yourself on Williams Road, one of, the, one of the roads that connect right to where the bars are, and like the other places that are gonna turn into restaurants. If Andy's automotive, because he's wanting to sell, if he sells, there's gonna be something there. Okay. No, just, you have one more minute. Yep, or Norsini's, or other places, the beverage places. So this would just be the beginning of establishing something, and to me, it would be destroying like the community that we have and turning it into a completely different neighborhood. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Any other uh, public comment on this?
Sarah Pilling, 29 Garrett Avenue. Yes, I do not live right next to the bars. I have lived in my home in Garrett Hill for 41 years. I've been asked by Patty and Rick, I understand, I think that many of you received their email today, but for the record, I would like to read it. They are taking care of a sick grandchild. So it starts this way. We are unable to attend tonight's meeting, but wanted to offer our comments with regard to the introduction of Ordinance 2023-03. Please do not introduce this detrimental and patently unfair ordinance. As the community labored over various interrelated issues during the Garrett Hill zoning process, which went on for four or five years with a meeting every week. The planners and steering committee eventually came to the realization that outdoor dining just does not fit in Garrett Hill. With regard to subsection 115.4a in parens 10 and parens F, setbacks for all other township residents, it's 500 feet. Proposed for Garrett Hill, 10% of what is considered adequate for everyone else, 50 feet. And that setback is only for single family dwellings. No setback for two families or semi-detached. Even with the protection of adequate setbacks, the prospect of outdoor dining is just not physically possible in Garrett Hill, given the close proximity of all residents in the Garrett Hill CR district. If outdoor dining were to be sanctioned in Garrett Hill, shouldn't the existing outdoor dining ordinance protections, section 280-115.4, protect Garrett Hillians as well? Why should Garrett Hillians be denied the peaceful enjoyment of their properties when the protection of adequate setbacks are provided for all other township sections? With regard to subsection 115.4a in parens 10 in parens g, increasing the number of seats without increasing piking, parking is ill-conceived. And Garrett Hill has very little parking. We are very narrow streets. While a one-seat indoor for a one-seat outdoor swap sounds good on paper, it is really unenforceable and therefore of no effect. It would only serve to increase the severity of the parking shortage in Garrett Hill and lead to conflict with attempted enforcement and competition for parking. Currently, this proposed ordinance benefits a single property owner, that's their opinion, at the expense of all others while leaving the door wide open to detrimental unintended consequences as redevelopment occurs. Zoning is meant to create protection, foster harmony, and enhance living in community. The proposed ordinance will ensure degradation and create conflict. Without setback and parking protections, adjacent, pro adjacent properties will see their property values diminished. Respectfully, do not introduce their de this detrimental and patently unfair ordinance. Thank you for all your efforts of Radnor Township residents from Patty and Rick. I want to add that last summer, while a proposal was made to take the lot behind all seasons and deep felices to turn it into a 17 parking lot, I heard neighbors who lived on Wentworth say, this is a neighborhood. We like it as a neighborhood. Commercial is fine, but it's not the purpose of this neighborhood. It is to be a neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? I am not seeing any, so we will call the vote. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Carry six to one. <clears throat> okay, we will, oh, um, but I do ask for, we've had this conversation. I want to hear the positive um, feedback from neighbors. Uh, moving on to 
The authorization for the solicitor to file an amicus brief in support of the Westchester Stormwater Ordinance appeal. Peter Nelson, will you please speak to this? Yes. Um, so as you know, um, the Westchester University filed suit in Commonwealth Court uh, against the borough of Westchester regarding a stormwater fee the borough had, had assessed. The Commonwealth Court at the end of this uh, trial found that the fee was actually a tax, in which case it could not be charged against the university system. Uh, the borough has appealed this uh, decision to the state Supreme Court, and uh, there are many parties that are filing amicus briefs, basically friends of the court briefs, uh, in support of the borough, arguing why this should be considered a fee and not a tax. Um, as you know, Radnor Township has a stormwater fee. Um, while we, as a home rule charter coming out of the first class township code, do have some different powers and uh, abilities than a borough does, it still concerns uh, both John Rice and I that the Commonwealth Court reached this decision. Um, it is a decision which, if you look across the country regarding this issue, it is quite an outlier. Um, almost every other jurisdiction that has looked at this issue has found that the stormwater charges are fees and not taxes. Um, and it kind of really puts uh, Pennsylvania out on a pedestal and not a good one. So um, we are requesting authorization to prepare and file uh, our own friend of the court brief um, in uh, support of the borough's appeal of this particular decision. Thank you very much. Do we have uh, any questions or comments from the board? Um, do I need a motion? Is this a vote? Yes, please. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. And a second? Second. second. Um, is there any comment from commissioners? I'll start there again. Uh, any public comment on this item? I'm not seeing any. I will call the vote. All in favor say aye. aye. Thank you. Thank um, you. Moving to item F, it's a presentation. Uh, by the Radnor Township Police Department regarding the 2022 police staffing study, hiring of, of new police officers and a mental health professional. Chief, are you coming up or are you? Yeah, well, uh, the chief will make his way up with his team if I could. Yes, Just a please. little introduction. Thank you. Um, I, I'll start by thanking the board for the opportunity to give this presentation tonight. Um, and also to those commissioners that met with the, the police department back last fall and again this spring to step through the specifics of the staffing study as well as you know, ultimately what, what you're gonna hear tonight. Um, I wanna stress that, that these recommendations coming from the administration aren't, aren't done lightly. Um, these are things that we, we take a lot of time to, to digest and recognize the fact that there are um, lots of competing ends for the different decisions that the board is required to make uh, we're bringing this to you tonight for considerations for a couple reasons. Uh, some highlights include um, it, this, as a matter of public safety, we felt warranted uh, a public discussion and some direction from the board on. Um, the staffing study does highlight some things that, um, that, that are concerning from a response standpoint to the public, in, including some increased response times. Um, the the, the lack of correlation between the township's growth over the last 20 years, yet our department is smaller today than it was 20 years ago. Um, and I know that's not a one for one, uh, I'm just talking about the correlation. Um, and, and just a general feeling from an from a operational standpoint that our department is short staffed um, and, and the study breaks that down in multiple ways, each with its own set of criteria, uh, but they all came to the same conclusion. Uh, different metrics and different requirements to get to get to full staff, but they were all consistent in that regard. Again, another a reason why we wanted to bring it to the board tonight. Um, you know, we understand um, again that these aren't easy decisions, uh, and, and just asking for additional staff 
uh, based on the study uh, wasn't enough. So over the last couple of months, it was asked of the department to go back and say, all right, well, what's the problem? What are we trying to solve? Um, so that we can offer uh, a solution or a new program or programs to help identify and solve problems. Um, and I think the police department, uh, through their efforts, uh, has done a really good job of developing uh, a program that uh, we're excited to present. Uh, lastly, uh, I, and when we ask for additional staff, again, we, we take it very seriously. And I, I think over the last couple of years with the two additional staff members that we've added, we've seen some successes. Um, in the Act 511 department, we've seen a, a major improvement in compliance. Um, it has corresponded to increased revenue, although the two aren't necessarily directly linked. Um, and then the same thing with the engineering. It, with some of our smaller stormwater projects that we've seen come to fruition, uh, getting our road program back on track this year, uh, those are the efforts coming from the new engineer. So uh, I, I mentioned that as, you know, again, when we come to the board with these requests, they are very serious, and we intend to improve Radnor Township through these recommendations. Um, so that's why we've asked the police to be here tonight. Uh, the police will give a presentation followed by Mr. Tate uh, in terms of the finances, uh, and then we'll go from there. Thank you. Commissioners and community, uh, good evening. I'm Superintendent Chris Flanagan. Uh, as some of you are already aware, some of you may not. Um, we have a uh, proposal here for your consideration. Radnor Township is a phenomenal community, and the police department, the women and men who serve it, are charged uh, daily with multiple duties. And those duties uh, are done very, very well, and without bias and with 100% heart. Since I've become a police officer 25 years ago, things have changed. They've changed here in Radnor, they've changed here in the state of Pennsylvania, and even a broader spectrum. But I do dial in here that we are charged to provide great police services, but with that, that means change and to challenge. We've addressed the manager's office, the board of commissioners a couple different times because you guys always listen to what we have to say. We don't always agree but we've met a couple times to review different challenges in law enforcement. With those challenges, we wanna be the most proactive police department. I gave you a copy of our mission statement, which talks about a safe environment, and I really wanna harp on that particular part. I think you know about our police department, but I think that the community deserves to know that we wanna grow and we wanna be responsive to the needs locally and for the visitors who come in who may have national experiences that play out right here in our own community. Tonight we're gonna to talk about a community support unit and growth of the police department. We're currently uh, asking to increase our department. Before I get started in a brief but important presentation, I'd like to introduce the parties who are gonna be helping us with this. This is Ms. Keeley Seymour, a Radnor resident and a licensed social worker. Candace Linehan from the Delaware County Victims Assistance Center, and Reverend Howard from our Police Chaplains Program, and as you already heard, local resident, uh, former football player, and has his pulse to the ground. Um, and then Mr. Tate is gonna help us uh, guide us through that. We would like to revolutionize police services in Radnor Township by starting two new units, adding to our existing staff We'd like to add a total of five officers and one civilian employee. We're breaking it down to two, basically, special units that get started, but really it helps every officer on every day provide better police services. And as we walk through what these officers and the civilian will do, if approved by the Board of Commissioners, it will lay the groundwork 
um, for a lot better services and, and an extreme amount of follow-up and what I would call customer satisfaction. Three officers and one licensed counselor, one civilian employee who would be, and we'll break that down exactly what their duties would be, would start our new community unit. This community unit would respond to crisis intervention duties, critical incident stress management response for community members and officers, also along with the police chaplains. They would be specialists in de-escalation techniques and also train other officers. And they would be peer managers where we review cases that we currently don't review. And I'll talk a little bit about some statistics with the mental health and domestic violence where peer management is important. Um, domestic violence response and follow-up, which will, there's a very specific slide on that as well. They would also spend time on crime prevention and responding to priority response calls. Building security assessment and school and community liaison functions, which are one of the highlights is our time with the schools. The second part of the new unit would be a new high density beat unit that would consist of two officers who stay within this beat generally, where they respond to where over 53% 50 of our call volume is. Um, we did a study uh, and from 2019 till now, we had over 77,000 responses in the zones that we'll show you in the upcoming slide. But basically, these would revolutionize how we do it, but we need to break that down just a little bit for you. Before I tell you what they can do, I wanna tell you what we're dealing with as a police department and what's happening in the community. Our mental health and welfare incidents. Check the welfare is sometimes a very simple call where somebody calls from out of state, tells us that somebody isn't answering the phone, we go up there and we check on them. A lot of times just the phone's off the hook, maybe the cable got disconnected. We kind of love those calls, we make sure that they get taken care of and there is really no other issue except time spent helping a community member. But there's also many other times where a patient may need to be assessed by EMS. They may be experiencing early dementia, they may not have food or other things where you get very, very involved. We also may find situations where we have to bring in our codes department or other social services based on the particular need on a welfare check. The next one um, is the one where the national lens talks about it quite a bit, but I'm here to dial in on our numbers right here in Radnor Township, and that is our mental health um, and those related incidents to that. As you can see, we also have a number called 302 for those in the community or commissioners don't know. That's an involuntary commitment where the police department is summoned by a family member or a coworker, somebody, a neighbor who may say that this person needs specialized services. The Radnor police will go uh, with a 302 warrant and take them down to Crozier Chester Medical Center, which is our 302 area, and take them for mental health evaluation. As you can see, we spend a lot of time uh, very justifiably, these are very important calls, the mental health calls and the check the welfare calls. And they don't seem to be slowing down, they seem to be more intense, very involved. Also, because of the way things have changed, we're spending a lot of time on why these are happening to people and really want to get involved in a proactive, not a reactive measure in reference to those mental health calls. Some of the other time we spend is very important, that's investing in our youth. I think we realize when we invest in our youth, it pays us back many years later. We, have, we do not have a lot of juvenile incidents here and we're very proud of that, but that does require some time and it also requires special finesse, especially when somebody's having some challenges, whether it be at home or school. Having our new community support unit will definitely dial in on that. Our youth aid panel, as you can see the numbers, is a diversionary program that's a proactive response to to identifying situations could be simply behavioral, just a simple correction and some involvement, but it also helps flesh out some other issues that may become where they need mental health services or just simple services or even educational services. This team, the Community Support Unit, would help us work on these statistics. This slide took its own, you know, really took its own pattern, and this is our domestic violence response. As you can see, um, these situations are filled with raw emotion and awfully, often fueled by anger and fear. These are very serious situations that often happen within a household or a family unit where the ripple effect is not just the two people who may be in conflict or the one person who's having an emergency. The ripple effect is significant to our community. We've seen murder suicides in our community because of domestic violence and it has just been a very impactful situation. 
One of the keys is good follow-up, making sure people can find their way from problems and to understand it's okay to have a problem, but we want to help you through. There are so many services in the state of Pennsylvania, Delaware County, and private sector that it's very important to stay on top of that. It's almost, it's a very, it's almost a full-time job, and that's what I'm here to tell you, is that we would like to coordinate that. So I'm going to ask Candace Linehan, who specializes in this type of response, just to give a quick perspective on that type of follow-up and value. Thank Candace? you, Chief. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. My name is Candace Linehan. I have been with Delaware County Victim Assistance Center, formerly Delaware County Women Against Rape, for the last 18 years. I'm considered an expert across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania as it relates to victim services. Uh, and it's a true honor to have those 18 years uh, working in partnership with Radnor Police Department. Our agency serves over 2,500 individuals, victims of crime in our county, all for free and confidential services. We provide uh, counseling and therapy, accompaniment services, and really a team effort when working with an individual. When we're talking about a victim of a trauma, we're talking about a human being who's been violated in the worst way. Our youngest is a three-month-old. Our oldest is a 96-year-old woman. So it happens to all people, and it knocks on everyone's door. The CDC looks at trauma, what I'm talking about as a victim of a crime, uh, violence, as a life-lasting, altering um, effects to one's mind, body, and soul. Costly public health crisis. And that's exactly what the chief is proposing, is efforts uh, to intervene for this public health crisis that we're uh, dealing with. The chief is bringing you data and information as it relates to his community policing. I ask you to think about this in a trauma-informed lens. What does trauma-informed policing mean? It means that it helps victims feel heard, understood, supported, and a better sense of safety and community. Provides a wraparound team approach to that individual and to their family members. We can't do this alone. It can improve the accuracy and quality of the information gathered by law enforcement. It enhances positive outcomes of police investigations and of prosecution. Best practices and modern interventions, what the chief is offering to you this evening, can build awareness in your community and ultimately prevent violence. I hope to be out of a job one day. It increases the likelihood of individuals within your community to gain a better trust and a relationship with law enforcement. Most importantly, and I think you would agree, providing victims and their family members, we're talking about human beings, our mothers, fathers, sisters, neighbors, children, with the rights, services, and options, and notifications that they desperately deserve. There is something under the Act 77 in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that requires victims to know what their rights are, something called the Bill of Rights. And that's what law enforcement, with better opportunity to be able to serve your community, will be able to do that uh, better. And we all deserve that. I 100% on behalf of our agency support the efforts of the Radnor Township Police Department. They have always provided um, high quality services perform performed with integrity and professionalism. And we will work as a team and we promise you that we'll give our best to your community in partnership with the individuals that I hope tonight that you'll vote that they can hire. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. And as you can see the domestic violence, it is so important that follow up um, by having this extra unit, it would allow other officers to go back on patrol and conduct proactive patrol functions. I am very privileged to introduce uh, a mother, a Radnor resident, 
and a professional who came to the aid of this project that has really helped enlighten us and help guide this presentation, but most importantly, the impact that a civilian who's trained in the profession can make. So I will not take any more, but introduce Keely Seymour. Hi, thank you for your time today. Um, my name's Keely Seymour. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I've worked in the field close to 18 years in a variety of settings, including hospital settings, mental health outpatient settings, treatment facilities, and other nonprofit agencies. I've had experience working with adolescents and adults struggling with eating disorders, trauma, anxiety, depression, intimate partner violence. Um, I think your packet has uh, attached my resume for further review of my experience. Um, I am a res Radnor resident. I've lived in the community in the Garrett Hill neighborhood for close to 10 years with my husband and two children. Um, I connected with Chief Flanagan a few months back um, through a mental health incident that occurred on my street. Um, and it led to open discussions about the need for more mental health support and training within the police department. Um, and I'm grateful that I had his ear to be able to have these conversations. Um, so this slide is introducing the potential social worker position embedded in the police department. And there's a, a detailed job description in the packet that you have um, with all the roles and responsibilities, but I'll just highlight a few that I feel are most important to, to acknowledge. Um, first and foremost, the, the potential social worker would be responding in real time to mental health crises um, and utilizing crisis intervention techniques, which is um, specialized training social workers receive in order to respond and de-escalate um, situations without use of force. The second most new, a very important piece of it would be follow-up. So responding and following up to um, residents after incidents have occurred to make sure that they're connected to the appropriate resources. Um, so that also would be connecting and collaborating with different agencies in both the township and the county um, and establishing partnerships in order to do a warm handoff from resident to the appropriate agency. Um, with just bringing up the incident that had occurred on my street, it was with a teen. And you know, the question I had asked is who's in, in treatment? And the only um, knowledge had was that the teen was. And I asked about the, the parents involved, and it was unknown whether the parents were receiving services. So you know, a teen could be receiving all the services they need for substance use or mental health issues, but if they're returning to the same environment and nobody is sure if, if the parents are connected to services, then um, it's, it's more likely that they're going to continue to call back to the police department and be in mental health crises. Um, so that piece is so important. One thing I forgot to mention is I, I do have a friend and a colleague, Amanda Mitten, who is a uh, police social worker embedded in the department of the State College um, Borough in Pennsylvania. And I, she's worked in the position for close to a year. Um, and I've had many conversations with her about her work and the improvement she's been able to do on the community. And one, um, she's been able to establish a collaborative partnership with a psychiatric practice where a referral coming to them from her will be seen within two weeks, which is so important um, that people are seen quickly within a window of motivation um, because t wait times now for psychiatric or therapeutic treatment can, can range from weeks to months. Um, so that would be maybe part of the potential position would be establishing these collaborative partnerships to get people um, quickly into treatment. Um, another piece, uh, Candace spoke to it, was um, being able to follow up as well with victims of crime um, and doing warm handoffs. Um, and lastly, also collecting data around the types of calls received, how many calls are received in order to collaborate with uh, the township in order to establish more prevention programs, um, both to, you know, to, according to the trends that are being seen within the township. <clears throat> One thing not mentioned on many of these slides also was substance use. And I just want to point out that 40% of adults experiencing substance use disorders also have an undiagnosed mental health condition. And also over 75% of those with substance use disorders have, a, have experienced one or more traumas in their life. 
And I feel like that's really important to highlight because those statistics aren't even being shown around substance use and how this social worker really could get involved in getting the residents connected to appropriate treatment for that underlying trauma in order to reduce the likelihood of calling the police department in the future. Um, so uh, that, in brief, is an overall um, description of how we viewed this potential position. Um, and I welcome any questions that you have, too. So. The Ryder Police are committed to progressive, innovative policing in accordance with recognized best practices of the police profession. The community support unit will provide prompter service in the high density areas for all emergencies, greater police coverage in all areas of the township, introduce a mental health professional to offer guidance and conduct follow-up, which will more effectively meet the needs of the public and the mental health calls for service, respond and follow up to domestic violence and juvenile calls for service, and interact with all victims of a crime in Radnor Township to assist with victim services and on a personal outreach from the Radnor Police. We, we didn't highlight this, but if you, let's just say you had a, um, you were at the trail and somebody broke out your window, stole your computer and your bag, um, this unit will also be responsible for reaching out to every resident who's affected by a crime. So it won't just be one thing. Um, and I want you to know that this is just making us grow and provide a higher level of service. Um, I acknowledge the Board of Commissioners for challenging us to do a better job. I believe 100% your challenge we've met with this presentation and the support of professional colleagues, Reverend Howard, um, and the amazing women and men in the Radnor Police Department. We have to grow and change with the times. I believe this is doing it. I believe it's cutting edge. And I believe that um, it will make Radnor a safer and better place to be. Uh, we are, going to ha we are going to be here at the back end of the presentation. I am going to turn it over to Mr. Tate to talk about finances and how this is going to happen if approved. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Commissioners. Just give me a moment to pull up the presentation. A moment or two. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, commissioners, for your patience. So, so just brief overview of the financial impact for um, considering this, these additional units. Uh, we'll take a look at the standalone cost of the additional units. Secondly, we'll present the financial model both with and without the grant. There is a COPS grant available to support the addition, uh, these additional units. 
And lastly, we'll present the real, real estate tax implication, again, with and without the grant. So again, at a very high level, the standalone cost to add the unit, um, under the assumption the unit is included by July 1st of this year. Um, we've included the cost of the unit along with the associated payroll liabilities and benefits, and then a projection out over the next five years, um, assuming normal cost increases, wage increases, uh, health benefits, and, uh, and, so, and, and the like. Um, so what does that really mean? So and when looking at the model, anytime we're looking at um, the expenditures, we're forecasting the projected revenue uh, to cover those expenses. Similar to our budget presentations, this has a, the five-year forecast of the accounting for the added expenses and the necessary revenue to cover that expense to achieve as much as possible a break-even in our budget. For 2023, this would be funded out of our excess fund balance. And then going forward, we include a forecast of increased taxes as well as the grant revenue uh, to cover the cost of the unit. Without the grant, same, same idea, but all of the revenue then is accounted for in with uh, real estate tax revenue. When we look at the real, real estate tax model, uh, we're basing it on um, township-wide assessed value as shown in our forecast that we've used in the, in the budget uh, presentations earlier uh, for 2023. Um, if we do receive, if we are successful with the grant applications, the grant would provide for $125,000 per officer. Um, it's a reimbursable grant, and the reimbursements occur over a three-year period. The necessary millage um, in order to meet and cover the expenses of, of the additional unit are shown here uh, at these percentages over the next five years. And when we look at that as a percentage of assessed value, um, really what it comes down to, it's a fraction of a percent of assessed value when we look at you know, individual homeowners and then convert it to a dollar value for average and median assessed values. Um, so initial year is high and then evens out over the next four years to support the cost of the unit. If we're not successful with the grant application, then of course 100% of the cost is borne by the um, change in the real estate tax revenue, slightly higher in the initial year, and then again, de minimis increases over the next four years, and again, a fraction of a percent of a homeowner's assessed value in looking at what, what the true cost of this program would be. So that's just at a very high level, the necessary revenue to support this new program. Any questions, I'll be happy to answer. So you're saying $100 a resident, essentially, on an average to support increase in taxes? No, that, that is actually an assessed value calculation. Um, so separately, we'll do, we'll do a real estate tax average and median calculation. This is, the, this is just the converting to an assessed value change for oh. The average resident. Um, it's not something I want to do on the fly at the moment. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I I think those estimates are on the bottom of those tables, though. That's what I thought. Yeah. I thought that's what I was reading, but to there. In real in real real estate tax dollars. Yeah, we, pro yeah, we provide it in, in three different terms. So first, as a percentage of the average real estate t uh, value, assessed value. Uh, and then what the cost would be for the average resident so that's uh, as well as the median. Yeah, that's what those three numbers that's are in the green box. I'm sorry. So it's an assessed value and a real estate, changing in real estate tax bill. Okay. But that's not per resident, though. That's per property, right? Per residential property? It's an average. Yes, per household. It's the average and the median would be the two numbers. So the initial bump in the first year and then more moderate bump in over the next four years. So I, I hate bringing this up because uh, 
I mean, the police, you guys, and there's some in the back room, I mean, you have the most thankless job to do, so I don't want to marginalize anything that can help you do your job and uh, make keep you safe. I'm, uh, this has my vote, period. Uh, I'm just curious what happens if you lose that grant, then what happens? I mean, is that, does that get bumped up? How much is that grant? Well, this. So it's, okay, worst case. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, I mean, yeah, so I'll just say this. I mean, if you're dealing with horrendous sex crimes, I don't think that you can put a price on someone's safety, a child's safety. Um, when it comes to, um, I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. Seymour, I don't wanna, um, if you're a doctor, I don't wanna, uh, your rank. Um, yeah. Are you a doctor Sorry. or just a social? Okay. Um, LCSW. Yeah, so no, um, it's a thankless job. I'm uh, familiar with incidents uh, in Garrett Hill. Um, and um, yeah, it's a mental health situation and to the police that are out there. It's probably the 80-20 rule where, you know, 80% of your calls are to 20% of the people. Um, so if you can do your best to not just stop the problem in, you know, acutely, but look at a long-term uh, holistic approach. I think that is, without a doubt, something that we owe our community, we owe to the less fortunate people, and we owe it to our, uh, our policemen and women um, who, you know, put their lives on the line every day and never know what they're gonna step into. The only thing that I do ask that if there is a social worker, that that is branched out to not only people of our township, but for instance, um, there was a terrible accident on Bryn Mawr Avenue um, a couple months back, and that can be pretty traumatic for members of the firehouse and the one-offs. So if they, you know, if there's free time and they, um, they need to talk to someone, I would like, um, you know, that social worker to encompass a little bit more, as well as their own sanity, that social worker may need a social worker, because um, you don't want, no, I mean, my sister, my, 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 my brother-in-law is a state trooper and my sister-in-law is a social worker. So like they come home and they have bad nights and I know that they have bad nights and sometimes they don't wanna to talk to each other and maybe it's best that they talk to somebody else. So I'll just say that and thank you. Um, thanks for everything that you do. I'd like to comment on, on two of those points and I think they're great points. Um, the first one is, and just to give an example, the incident that occurred on my street with the family I noticed at least four officers and at least three EMS, and I know that they're repeat callers. And so if you take the cost of all the emergency services and crisis services used for every single incident and you get those people into the appropriate services, the likelihood of them calling dramatically reduces. So I think not only there's like a long-term quality of life in the community benefit, but also financially it may at some point even out. Um, and then secondly, you know, we didn't mention this, but I, through my conversations with my colleague Amanda, that has been a little bit part of her role as well, is just being supportive to the officers because it is really hard. They re experience trauma themselves and it can increase um, rate of burnout. And so this position really could support them um, and in turn really benefit the community too, so. I'm an easy yes, uh, so I'm gonna ask about an ancillary issue that's been bugging me for a while. I saw that there are 100 302 commitments in the township per year, which is like three out of every thousand people in the township, which just feels high to me. I, I'm sure that there are multiple instances where you've got the same person coming back year over year. Um, but even if you cut that like by three, you're still with one out of every thousand people in the township is being involuntarily committed every year, which just feels high to me. Could you guys speak to whether that's a like average statistic across the state or are we unstable as a township? More than I knew of. It was total. Yeah. It, and I'll go back to, I don't want to crash this, but I'll go back to the slide. It was a combined mental health and 302, so not a totality a 302's commissioner. It just, our system codes it, so we just, we only had so much space on the PowerPoint. So 
we would have to just bring that number down, but that is not a total of 302s. It is mental health emergencies and 302 responses combined. Got it. Okay. Withdrawn. Thank you. Good catch. I was worried. So, can I? Yeah. Oh, I also am a proponent of this program. I think it is necessary, and I want to reiterate how I, I do really think that there is a cost benefit to something like this in terms of what you just said, and that was a question I had. You know, do you think that programs like this, based on what your friend is telling you, is it reducing the amount of money? Is it preemptive in that way? Yeah, and I think they're, you know, not only also connecting people to the appropriate services so that they're getting treated for the underlying condition and not needing to call emergency services um, time and time again. So yes, I think that overall there's you know, a cost benefit to this as well as just quality of life. Yeah. Or um, can you just repeat the name of the um, service that you are with and how you will sure, work absolutely. in tandem? Thanks. Um, so I'm with Delaware County Victim Assistance Center, formerly Delaware County Women Against Rape. We were founded in 1974 as the second professional agency in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. In the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, we're very fortunate because every county has its own victim service provider that's a nonprofit. So we're not government, we're not county. What's really critical is in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, every individual who works as a victim advocate, trained as a victim advocate, there's a 40-hour training in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that's required. Um, we hold privilege, and so it's as absolute as a clergy privilege. Um, and so that's that unique piece where that warm handoff is really important, that an individual can start to feel safe and build that rapport and trust with somebody from our organization. Um, and then we uh, work in a team effort with law enforcement. The way that we would support is how we've already been doing it. Um, however, we would obviously support the individuals that are hired within these designed roles. Um, and that warm handoff would be ideally that social worker. I'm also a licensed social worker, um, and, the, and I've done a job description for Upper Darby Police Department. We actually have our own victim advocate in that police department as well, and you're right on about that benefit financially um, to their community as well. And so we would work in conjunction with law enforcement as that warm handoff. What that social worker couldn't provide, we would continue to provide what we've already been providing all these years with Radnor. Is that helpful? Sure. So, um, first of all, Chief, thank you. I know that you and I had um, lots of conversations about how policing in Radnor can be forward thinking and innovative and creative, and this was just what I was hoping for. So, um, really thrilled to hear about the program. Um, and I'm uh, even more impressed now that we have, uh, you've brought in professionals and I know you've done research and you've shared with me what you've learned, all of us what you've learned and um, I really think this is one of the more exciting um, programs that we've heard about in some time. So you definitely have my support. I wanna thank you for um, walking through this um, and getting us here and you know, in my ward, we face things like, and I'm, I know it's in other places in the township, but um, you know, we have hoarding situations in our township, and I know as much as um, I've heard about the, the sensitivity and care that our officers take when they um, encounter these situations, oftentimes um, I think we're all left feeling like a quick correction, but no in-depth um, services, you know, you can make a connection to an agency, but no um, ability or really role to follow up, no s space to kind of enter their lives. Um, I worked for 10 years at an agency in victim services. I am not a, a social worker, but uh, I worked with 25 to 30 master's level social workers for 10 years, so I'm a big fan of the profession, and I know the value um, that somebody like this will bring to our team. And I know that you have in mind um, how the officers who will be in this unit will um, be a little bit different than the day-to-day -day operations that are um, currently staffed. And I appreciate the attention to that. So um, you definitely have my vote. I'm not sure if we've heard from everybody. We can keep having a discussion. 
this tonight was a presentation. I don't think it's a it's an actual vote, but it, we can give you a sense of the board to move forward and keep it moving. Um, I'm going to look over to make sure that I'm stating that correctly, um, Mr. White. Yes. Yeah. That would um, uh, understanding the board's feelings tonight would help us get some pieces moving, uh, and then we could bring. Uh, to the board at the next meeting, the, org the resolution to change the organizational chart to amend the, the head count um, accordingly. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a sense of the board already, but I have, we haven't swept down this way. I think typically what I do is ask for a smile and a nod, a thumbs up, something that we're continuing the conversation. Can I make uh, one quick comment? Yeah, please. Um, I've done some preliminary discussions here with, with some of the folks involved, but um, my one concern is that one social worker is not gonna be enough for this program, <laughs> that you have listed a lot um, for this person to do, and, and initially just developing the program is gonna be a big deal. So just keep that in the back of your head, but I'm all for it. So, not yeah, all good. Up. I agree with what Maggie said. <laughs> okay. Um, I feel like you've got the majority of the board is nodding and smiling and um, receiving this really well. So um, I look forward to next steps and um, thank you for the efforts that you've put in. And uh, we really appreciate your expertise here tonight. You okay. Okay, we will keep this moving. The next is resolu Resolution 2023-50, authorizing the award of construction contract B23001 for the 2023 <coughs> super, pa super paved street resurfacing project to Glasgow Inc. to include contingency and construction inspection and administration in the total amount of $1,611,764. To be funded from the liquid fuels fund. Um, I'm gonna, one, two, three, four, five. I'm gonna ask for a motion. So moved. And a second. Second. And uh, Mr. Norsini. Com Commissioner, thank you. So, just for the board to remember, this is a combined project of last year's funds and this year's funds. That's why it's so sizable. Uh, we respectfully request the award to Glasgow Incorporated. Is there um, any questions, comments from commissioners? Is there any public comment? I'll call the vote. All in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Um, moving next to, um, let's see, item H, resolution 2023-48, authorizing the payment of change order number two to RoadCon Inc. for the additional cost of the disposal of contaminated material for the King of Prussia Road and Eagle Road storm sewer system and intersection improvements project, that's contract B22-004, in the total amount of $30,169 to be funded from the proceeds of the 2019 general obligation bond. May I hear a motion? So moved. And a second. Second. And um, Mr. Norsini. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. So this project has had some hurdles in getting moving. It is literally starting back up again tomorrow. Uh, we had a water line, two water lines that had to be relocated, and then we ran into contaminated soil. Uh, this is solely to pay for the disposal of that contaminated soil at a different facility. That's the costs include uh, the additional trucking and expense to dump it at the site. Mr. Rossini, what, what was the contaminant? Uh, arsenic was one, and I, I apologize, I don't recall the other. Uh, so What you sent around had lead on it. Yeah, So, th and this is in the street. Very unusual for us to have contaminated soil in the street. That's where the majority of this work takes place. So this was somewhat surprising, but we've worked all that out. Contractors ready to start back up, and uh, if this is approved, away we go. Is there any... Commissioner Comer? Is it well in, inside the contingency, I mean? I, I, I forgot to mention, we are well within our contingency. Uh, part of that being because the project hasn't really progressed much, but yes, we are well in our contingency. They were working today, by the way. Can I ask a follow-up question with the lead? So this is lead paint, uh, I'm sorry, lead, not paint, lead, um, what is it? Soil. Is it, this, so is that from 
gasoline? I mean, is it that? I, I guess that's my question. Is this, is this from like old school lead gas or is this just another environmental? Can you kind of pinpoint what is causing some of these environmental concerns? No, so Ooh. in this particular case, no. It's, okay. in, it's in King of Prussia Road. It's in the road bed of King of Prussia Road. Uh, that's a very old road. I don't know how or why it got there. We know how contaminated soil got in the West Wayne Preserve. It was physically yeah. dumped, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I, I really can't tell you what, what occurred here to make this happen. How, how deep is it in the soil? So it was encountered in the trenches that they started digging. Uh, so today they were just literally moving back all their big machines to start tomorrow. So it's anywhere from four to five to six feet deep. Okay. It's deep. Okay. Any other questions, comments from commissioners? Is there any public comment? I will call the vote. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Moving on to item um, I. It's resolution 2023-49. Authorizing the payment of change orders number three through six to Marina Corporation for installation of the temporary ADA ramp transition, installation of additional cable and conduit to relocate the traf traffic signal controller, transfer of fiber to the controller and installation of traffic signal loop sensors for the East Lancaster, Barley Cone Lane to Garrett Avenue, Pedestrian Improvement Project, Contract B22-006, in the total amount of $17,516 to be funded from the proceeds of the 2019 General Obligation Bond. Uh, may, I, no. may I hear a motion to approve? So moved. And a second? Second. And any discussion? Yeah, um, just a quick question. Wow, this is old. So this is basically the adapter, so it's kind of lack of a better term, kind of like um, like Atlantic City and Margate, like where the the lights are all timed, or no? Or are you just moving the actual hard box? Uh, th so this was specifically for, I had them extend the transitions on the temporary ADA ramps for the winter. I didn't want okay, anybody so to trip. Uh, the additional cable and conduit to relocate the, set, the traffic signal controller the relocation of the traffic signal controller was part of the base bid, but the conduit under the street wouldn't accept the cable, so they had to redo that. Uh, that includes the transfer of fiber to the controller, and we also found out that one of the loop detectors on Lancaster Avenue was bad, so we had that replaced as part of this project. Uh, the project is essentially complete, except for a few minor punch list items. Uh, and this is well, well within the contingency for that project. So we should. Okay. This wrap doesn't up. move that box on Lowry's, on the corner of Lowry's, that big box that is makes it difficult to cross. No. Which side? I'm sorry. So we uh, did move the, the one side, box. Right? The west side, right? No? This is still there? All right. Well, <laughs> maybe uh, I'll ask for that for Christmas. All right. Any other um, comments from commissioners? Any public comment on this item? I'll call the vote. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, and that was it for the agenda items. Um, not bad at all. I will ask now for reports of our board liaisons. Any, any news from our commissions and committees? Thanks. Um, so the Department of Health um, met last, a week ago. Um, and we had our wonderful student intern presentations, which was really great. Two um, Radnor High School students that took take on a project of their own design, and in this case, they did sleep deprivation and driving in teens, and it was a really fascinating. It was mostly uh, research and anecdote, but it was still a fascinating idea and I think a really important issue. Um, the other thing is that uh, Delaware County Health Department Department of Health, sorry, um, does have a survey going on on their website, and Molly very kindly, at the request of the Board of Health, had it also put on the township website. So if you get a chance, um, go ahead and take the survey. Other reports? Yeah, um, I was at the uh, um, 
Parks and Rec meeting, and I know he, he just left the room, but Steve Norsini did an excellent presentation on the West Wing Preserve. Um, I know that that was, uh, it's not something that I like to see a $3 million bid go on consent, but uh, for those that want to learn more about that project, uh, just watch the meeting, uh, very in-depth, um, and it's hopefully going to be environmentally friendly. Uh, they're doing the right thing. I know that Tammy Cohen, um, she's on top of that. And again, uh, I'd like to thank her for uh, everything that she's done, including the legislation today for the uh, Garrett Hill street naming, as everything that she does, whether it's at Arisio or Fenimore, um, she's got a lot of, uh, a, lot of a lot to juggle uh, at, with the short staff. So um, hopefully, um, and I think she did talk about changes in the org chart there as well. So I uh, just want to thank uh, the workers, uh, the staff, as well as the committee for all that they did. Other reports? I will uh, move on to new business. Oh, new Madam President, if I could, just yes, real sir. quick, I don't, um, I just, if, just real quickly, wanted to give a quick shout out to Shade Tree. Um, they had a very successful tree planting program. Um, at the request of Shade Tree uh, members, sorry, we sent out a handful of thank you letters to the various volunteer or, or companies that um, gave us either time or materials to help with that. Uh, in total, uh, 80 bare root trees were planted throughout the township, um, which is uh, an amazing success. So just a quick shout out to Shade Tree on that front. Um, those letters did go out, uh, and it's uh, always nice to see when the folks come together and, and get a program like that put together. Uh, and then just, just real quickly, Commissioner Farhi, with the consent on the West Wayne Preserve, tonight was just permission to go out to bid. Uh, when those bids come back, the, pro the full project, along with the cost, will be back in front of the board under the business agenda for a discussion and a vote. Yeah, no, I, I know. It's just it's, sometimes you see it and you're like, wow. So, uh, but no, I know, I know that it's not going to go on consent when we vote for it or introduction. Yes. Um, moving on to new business. Any new business? I would like to just take a moment and recognize that our Commissioner Jim Riley um, had a successful election and a special election on uh, primary day. So, congratulations. I don't think so. No. No, no swearing in. Okay. <laughs> Oh, uh, the elections are final. Oh, right. Uh, okay. <laughs> Understood. Any other new business? I just say one, one more thing. Yeah, again, to what you said, I didn't really get a chance to say to Bill and to Bob Tate. Uh, again, I, I know that when you took over the township, I, I'm seeing these eyes. It's all positive. It's all positive. <laughs> Uh, there were a lot of uh, items when it came down to the finance department, and you definitely turned the ship around. So I know, speaking for me uh, and my residents, it's a thankless job, probably more thankless than the public works, because no one knows what goes on, the number crunching, the Excel spreadsheets, but just a, just a quick thanks and props for, uh, for what the, uh, the quietest of do. So it, thank you. I, can I, do you mind if I take a second and respond, Madam President? No, I, just, I appreciate the kudos. Um, but it, it, on day one, it was made clear by the Board of Commissioners this needs to get fixed. So uh, when that kind of clear message comes down, it, it gets everyone in line quickly. And like I said earlier tonight, we have a fantastic staff who were all very, very willing and ready to, to make those corrections. And then over the years, the Board has supported, I mean, it, We've bought a lot of software. We've bought. We've added staff. I mean, it wasn't easy or quick, but um, the commitment was there, and it was set from the top, which made it very easy. So I appreciate that. Is there? Um, did I do old business? I don't think we have that. Okay. So I will ask for public participation. Sarah Pelling, 29 Garrett Avenue a senior and a 41-year resident. I would hope that the township will look at ways to save through other programs. 
the amount of money that's going to be spent on very valuable police and social worker. We had an experience on my street, and I watched the police and the chaplains very carefully deal with it. But it is not over. It is a continuing issue. So I'm absolutely in support of it. But we're not the federal government. We can't just make money. And seniors are on a fixed income. So I would hope that the township would look at ways to cut back in other areas when possible so that we don't have a potential $100 tax increase. Please, thank you. Any other public comment? I will, um, <laughs> do I have a, a motion to adjourn and a second? Aye. All in favor say aye. aye. Good night.